Yeah. Answer. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get going with the show here. Hope everyone got to grab some uh, pizza. My name is Richard Snyder. I'm a professor of political science here at Brown University. And I want to welcome all of you to, uh, to this panel today on uh, Latinx youth identity and Caribbean popular music. Um, just to give you a sense of how the event is going to flow, uh, I'm going to give an introduction, obviously. Then we're going to have a, two presentations um, by two colleagues, Pablo Herrera and then Jenny Lamb. And then we'll have some conversation uh, among the younger generation here, uh, Eric Tima Funk and Sebastian Otero. We'll open up the questions. Then at the end, stay put because we're going to have an unplugged, informal jam session, just a couple of songs unplugged. So if you want to see Tima Funk plugged, plugged in, you've got to come to. Ocean Mist tonight at uh, 9 o'clock, which is in Matunic, about 40 minutes south of here. And it may be far, but the price is right. I believe it's $10 admission to get in. And is it 21 plus, or do we know? It is 21 plus to get in? Okay. Um, so come and catch that if you're, if you're able. Uh, okay, a little bit of, uh, of background about why we're holding this event here at... Uh, at Brown University, um, a couple of reasons. So uh, we're building on a, on a foundation of ties and connections with Cuba um, that goes back, well, arguably more than 20 years, but certainly 10 years of, uh, of exchange of students and faculty um, with our partner institution in Havana, Casa de las Americas, and my colleague Esther Whitfield, who's here in the back, um, is a, a key uh, Part of the reason why we have that program, and I'm not sure how many Brown students have gone to spend a semester or even a year abroad. Now, have any of you? Let me see some hands. Yeah, okay, that's a good number here. And I think over the years, it's probably close to 100. I don't think that would be exaggerating. Maybe we'll say 100, round it up. Um, also here, oh, feedback. Um, here at Brown, we've also, over the last decade or so, uh, had some amazing Cuban uh, pop stars come through. And Eric Simafunk is, is just the, the latest of these. So uh, we've had Kelvis Ochoa, December Bueno together, which is an unusual thing just three years ago. Uh, the Afro Cuban funk group, Grammy nominated and Latin Grammy nominated group Palo. The Latin Grammy nominated singer Leslie Cartaya. Uh, the great Cuban conguero Pedrito Martinez has been here recently. And uh, here you see uh, Roman Diaz also, the great conguero with the summer and, uh, and Pedrito there. And if you're interested in, in this history, there's a PBS documentary that aired nationally uh, two years ago called Ivy League Rumba, which tells the story of Brown's connection to that point to, uh, to Cuban and Afro-Cuban pop music. Um, you can watch it here for free, and you don't have to be 21, I don't think, um, at this link. Okay, so just a little bit of 
a background, and we see uh, Eric Simafunk's visit uh, as part of this uh, continuing and hopefully moving forward this tradition. Um, let me uh, quickly thank the sponsors and co-sponsors who made this event possible. Um, obviously, the Watson Institute, which we're in, uh, for international and public affairs at Brown University. John Mazza is in the back uh, providing able technical support. The whole staff is here. Also, Brown Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Kay Goldman. Um, we have to thank her for the, at least for the pizza um, and probably for more. Uh, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice here at Brown. Um, the Department of Hispanic Studies, the Department of Music, thanks to Joshua Tucker, who uh, is here and uh, has played a role in, in helping sponsor this. I also want to send a shout out to uh, Cuba Educational Travel, or CET, and the president of that uh, organization, Colin Laverty, as well as, as his staff, um, including especially Miriam Sykes. They've been uh, uh, the tour managers for SEMA Funk's U.S. Uh, tour. Um, okay. So, having said that, let me uh, introduce our first speaker, Pablo um, Herrera. Um, get my notes together. So, Pablo Herrera is an Afro-Cuban hip-hop producer um, who's managed urban musicians and many different kinds of music-related projects in Cuba for over 20 years. He's regarded as a pioneer of the Cuban hip-hop sound. Um, his credits as a cultural producer include coordinating the Black August Collective Showcases in Havana. Um, this was a series of U.S.-Cuba people-to-people -people music events. Um, Black August brought to Havana's International Hip Hop Festival performers such as Moss Def, uh, Talib Kweli and his Black Star group, Dead Prez, Common, and Tony Touch between 1998 and 2002. Um, Pablo is currently a fellow at Harvard University at the, uh, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Studies. He's also completing a PhD in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews um, in Scotland. And he's doing research on the relationship between the sound of Afro-Cuban life and Afro-Cuban citizenship in Havana. So I think what I'm going to do is introduce speakers as they speak. So let me invite Pablo up right now and see if we can get his presentation going on my computer. Welcome, Pablo. Okay, okay. Yeah. what do you have to do here? I'm gonna go back to the beginning of this. Um, yeah, that's the beginning. So, um, Richard asked me to give, thank you, Richard, thank you so much. Actually, uh, again, thank you so much, Richard, for this invitation. And um, I also want to thank people that I've actually written who uh, work here uh, at um, Brown. Mr. Whitfield, again, we have emailed many, many years ago. How are you doing, Jürgen? Good. And um, Brown, obviously, for me, is, is, is a beautiful place. I've always somehow had Brown in back of my mind. So it's actually a pleasure to be here to talk to you about some ideas. I'm not going to get too fancy about it. But what I wanted to do with this idea of bringing context to Simafunk, uh, Eric Simafunk, <laughs> I hope he can see what, what I'm about to show, uh, was basically some ideas um, relating to my encounter with him and sort of the first sort of ideas that I got when I first saw uh, So this is um, an overview. It's really brief. So what happened is that I, I arrived in Havana in May last year, and um, this was happening across the street from my house. Oh, sorry. Go back. Yeah. <laughs>
mainly what I want to do, and I'm actually not a person that does that much video. I do a lot of work on sound. But I'm, I think it's important to have visuals now so people can get it, a better reference of what I'm talking about, or a particular reference of what I'm talking about. So I am, I'm across the street. This is 3rd and, and, and 12th in Vidal. And I'm thinking, what's that music? I see all these people, and then the music starts playing. And I'm thinking, what's going on? And I start hearing Van Van. Like, start, wait, wait a minute. So I start actually trying to record the whole show because I'm all about sound ethnography, which is basically recording rather than writing about what I see, or actually recording audio rather than writing about it. And I decide to come downstairs and forget about my, all my gear or my recording gear, because it's not really working. And I go downstairs, and I end up meeting Robert Pico Cacases, who's the leader of Interactivo, the band that, uh, sort of one of the bands, or the last band that was basically um, uh, hosting Cinema Funk as one of the, 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 the singers. And uh, I think what's interesting is that Interactivo has become, in a sense, the new school of inter alternative artists, but in the same way that Van Van or La Orquesta Reve was in the past, in the 60s, 70s, for many musicians that now we see, uh, like uh, they, um, um, Tosco, Jose Luis Cortez, was actually a musician, was actually before in, in, in Iraquere, and then he went off and did some bands. So now we see in the Sima Funk was an interactive, and now he's going on and done, basically going off on his own and, done, and doing his own project. So then I, he, Robertico tells me, listen, uh, Sima Funk is playing at Berto Brecht. You should go check him out. So like I go to Berto Brecht, and when I go and I see, um, enter, go, go inside, this is what I see inside the show. <laughs> So I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is, this is, this is really, so in part, my presentation is actually very brief about the references that I thought um, came to mind when I, and so what's going to follow will be some reference to his performance in what he does. And then I'm going to ask him a last question, a last question re basically regarding um, if he's speaking to other Afro-Cuban and Cuban artists who actually work outside of the, outside of the island and with the island as well, and whether he's in, in conversation, not exactly musically, but in, this, in, in, in the sense of the front of Afro-Cuban musicians, Cuban musicians who are actually out in the world uh, representing Cuba again, in the same way that Cubanismo did it before in the 50s and the, in the, in the, in the, in the 40s, and other musicians who have actually come out of Cuba and started representing the island. And I think something that's below this question or underneath this question is this idea that Quebec has a rebirth, a musical rebirth, or not. And um, the first reference is this one. And this is Oguere. I, I worked with Oguere before in Havana. I produced some of the music. I didn't produce this particular song. But what I want you to notice is, in a sense, how Eric's face, and this is what I see as an anthropologist, Eric's face is changing from musician to musician to what we see today, but there is basically a whole history that we can think of as, um, say, Eric is the tip of the iceberg, the iceberg that we see today, but there's a history of musicians below him that have been you know, working the same genre, but haven't really been seen outside of Cuba. This is Oguere, uh, Tengo el Control. Oh, sorry. Go back. Oye, dice que, dice que llegó un monzapilón, mira, ya tú sabes, la musiconga, que, hey yo, vine pa' darte pa' tomar control, que los que hablan de arte solo dan amor, y que niño no hay nadie que manda ti, pero si dan y que eres de oficina, ja, vine pa' darte pa' romperte hielo, empezó este bol y no los da palones, que, Así lo vete de Gondón y los que no jugaron no se le 
hey, que me van a, hey, que no llego, hey, ah, ellos no ven que mi condición para parar el tren y que verdad no hay freno. Right, so um, I'm thinking, sounds completely like Ogede, it looks like Ogede almost to me because I play very close to me, but then he's not Ogede. What he's doing is something that's very different. And obviously there's a reference that I wasn't thinking of talking about, but this is, when I saw him shirtless talking before, I thought this is like the fella kind of thing, almost. But then I continued thinking about the Cuban references and I went on to think about uh, Frijol Negro, who also did funk in the mid, uh, basically early, early 2000s, late 90s. This is the other reference. The sound on this one is not great, but... Perhaps I can talk about it. I think the main thing about it is this, this the whole history of people in Cuba and actually Havana, particularly, who've used funk and American influences to do their music and have a discourse that has to do with the city and ways in which the city could be played and talked about and discussed through music as well. And then the other reference is someone that's actually in the video before, who's Rolly Berrio. I don't know if you know Rolly Berrio, but I, 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 the, the fact that he talked, and actually there's a, there's a couple songs in your album, you have um, Para el Tiempo y Alabao, who, and you say that they, they, you come from a Trova uh, background, make me think of Rolly Berrio as something that basically you know, brought, um, sort of springs very easily. Specifically the way Rolly Berrio does his music, and it's like sort of free, the, the cadence, the kind of rhythm he does, and the kind of, the way he does his music and the, the, the ability to be a musician without any effort whatsoever. This is Rolly improvising. Dime que no puedes, ay, que no te conviene, que ni loca tú me irás a amar. Y verás que el mundo sigue igual de mal. And again, I mean, I want you to see again this face. Obviously, not all black men look the same. But as a person who's from Havana, I see his face similar to many other musicians who've come before, uh, or actually have come before, and do something that's similar. And obviously, the next reference is uh, Kashibache, which I think is incredible. Listen. Poof. Free jazz. Stool bus. Tres. Esfuerzo de una frase para tu timidez Afinemos la guitarra, a ver, va y si no sé qué Pero me queda bien, no hace falta leer el papel Yo te enseño, pero escucha bien, cuidado, no te enredes Relájate, vuelvo a empezar otra vez Los dedos, la chispa, tú tienes condiciones Ya la idea se va pegando, las emociones irán llegando No tanto en mentes, vamos, uff, muy bien Repite ese pasaje, pero recuerda, matiza Pa' que te suene mejor, no lo piensa, camina, valora Right, so, so, so with Kashi Vashe and, and other musicians like Rolly Berrio, there's a very, very strong tradition of, of you know, use of African-American music in Havana, in Cuba in general, that we should note. Um, because it's, it's a conversation that's, that's not just um, with, with, with the tradition of Trova within Cuba, but it's also a tradition of, of conversation and dialogue with African-American music, more like a people-to-people -people conversation. The next uh, uh, reference is obviously Irakere. <laughs> Hey. I want it. 
With Irakele, I think there's a promise. Irakele became the first band uh, to win a Grammy, an American Grammy, outside of Cuba, after 1950. That actually says a lot about the recognition of the music uh, coming from Cuba in this country. But also speaks about the promise of him becoming that kind of artist that has caliber to also have that much recognition outside of Cuba. And then, also, and then basically, as a conclusion, my last question. The first question is, again, what are his references? Why is the referencia? And then the other. Um, the other question is, is he speaking to these artists that I, that I see, that I think actually are in connection with them? You know, Danai Suarez, Ibeyi, Raimia Rosena, Yosani Terni, Kumar, Tulevao Beat, Axel Augar, Pedrito Martinez, and Randy Acosta. That's basically my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pablo. Hmm? That's good. Thank you, Pablo. Let me uh, quickly introduce our next speaker, my colleague here at Brown University, uh, Professor Jennifer Lamb. And uh, Jenny is an assistant professor of history here at Brown, uh, but not for long. She's just been promoted to tenured associate professor. Take effect sometime this summer. Congratulations, Jenny. And uh, her research explores the intersection between political history, intellectual history, and popular culture with a special focus on Cuba. She's the author of Madhouse, Psychiatry and Politics in Cuban History, which was published by University of North Carolina Press in 2017, and which traces the history of mental illness and mental healing in Cuba. Quite appropriate given the title of Eric's uh, first album, Terapia. So they have some. Bridges here to, to make therapy for those who don't speak Spanish. Um, she's also the co editor of the just published book, The Revolution from Within, Cuba 1959 to 1980, published by Duke University Press. She also directs here at Brown an exciting project, a digital humanities project called Beyond the Sugar Curtain, Tracing Cuba US Connections Since 1959. And this project explores the past and present of people-to-people -people travel and encounters between the United States and Cuba in an effort to co contribute to the quite fitful process of diplomatic normalization between Cuba and the United States. I should add that Sebastián Otero has contributed to, uh, to this project as well. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Jenny Lamb. Uh, thank you so much, Rich, and uh, to everyone who's here. I'm really excited to this event um, because, as some of my students know, this happens to be my special passion, Cuban music, that is. Um, so I'm going to speak, uh, I think, about a longer history of national connections, building on what Pablo talked about, um, to provide maybe a little bit of a context for thinking about these kinds of connections across the Florida Straits and what they've brought in the area of popular culture. Um, and I'm actually going to focus the most on the recent history of these connections, specifically those changes that came along with diplomatization, and spe specifically some of the changes to migratory law on both sides of the floor Strait, and how that in, in many ways fomented the explosion um, or new explosion of Cuban music, specifically in South Florida, but also extending beyond. I'm going to talk the most about Guatón, which for my students also won't be a surprise. Um, but these connections, as, as I said, really stretch much further back. So we could trace them all the way back to the 19th century, in fact, and the ways in which American musical traditions and Latin American musical traditions evolved in concert, and particularly the place that Cuba has long played in those kinds of exchanges. And in fact, many of the genres that we most associate with atmospheric American music are very much the product of that kind of fertilization. Talk about danzón or son, cha cha cha, mambo as being some that are most definitive Cuban, but obviously infused with hemispheric sounds. 
And on the other side, jazz and the contribution of Cuban musicians and rhythms, jazz as it emerges. And so I think in this respect, even though there's a broader hemispheric logic for the connections, we could also look to the peculiar intimacy between Cuba and the United States to explain the particularly uh, rich and, and fruitful uh, kind of co-articulation of musical genres and also dance styles as well, which I won't talk about as much, but we could have a lot to say about. Um, and I think uh, it's pro probably just as easy to go to maybe the most prototypically Latin American dance form and music form salsa to see exactly this, a form that Dio Puente himself said was musica cubana, porque salsa es la cosa que se echa en la comida, right? It's all musica cubana, that is to say, son. So we tend to think about 1959 as being a point of rupture in this longer history of connections. And there's no question that some of the political tensions that come along with the Cuban Revolution, and specifically the embargo that the United States puts on Cuba, makes it harder and harder to achieve these kinds of connections across the Florida Strait. Um, but they don't, of course, disappear. And I think, in fact, in the area of popular music, they're particularly clear. Um, so I recently had the pleasure of interviewing somebody who was involved with the early casino scene in Cuba, who some people credit with being the founder of casino, whatever that means. Casino, if you don't know it, is the musical, the dance style rather associated um, first with son and later with uh, songo, timba, um, and uh, el abuelo, as, as everybody calls him, the grandfather said, well, yeah, I mean, casino is basically like you put son together with Elvis Presley. Right? And that's how you should understand where it comes from. Of course, then um, enriched, as he would put it, by many uh, Afro-diasporic dance styles as well, uh, especially rumba. We could look to Beatles mania in early 1960s Cuba as another site where these connections remain rich. Um, but also Black American music, which I think is often forgotten in the focus on groups like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, um, but that those Afro-diasporic musical connections remain very much alive. And you can find these sporadic accounts of, even when it becomes harder and harder to listen say, to American radio stations in Cuba, and likewise, somebody out in Eastern Cuba capturing a US radio station that's playing Luther Vandross, for example. So the, the germinal influence of Luther Vandross on a generation of Cuban musicians, I think we don't even begin to know some of those stories yet. Um, and of course, someone like Michael Jackson as well, obviously a complicated figure in our present, but to my mind, um, one of the very best Michael Jackson tunes was actually performed by a Cuban band, Climax. And if you haven't heard their cover of Black or White, it's really, really awesome and worth listening to. Um, so it might seem that this mutual influence that we can trace on the Cuban side is less palpable on the U.S. side of things, especially as a result of the embargo and the pressures that many uh, DJs, radio stations, music producers face to basically banish Cuban music in the airwaves. And we know that this pressure real. Um, but in spite of that fact, there were dissident DJs who kept playing Cuban music throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, and even groups that continued to tour. So I remember meeting in New York people who'd been going to see Van Van in U.S. tours um, dating back to the 1980s, for example, on the West Coast. And even though the Van Van might have been protested in Miami, there were other places where they were, of course, welcomed. So I think the popular image of Cuban music crossover in the United States is Buena Vista, which has always struck me as not only problematic, but really, really strange, because, of course, the kind of music that they perform becomes this vehicle for transnational nostalgia. Right? Let's look back to the way these connections used to seem before 1959 in a way this very much meets popular U.S. expectations as to what Cuba as a whole represents. Frozen in time that hasn't evolved since then, et cetera. But I think as the recent crossover success of Gente de Sona would suggest, there are other kinds of connections that we might face as well. Um, and here, I, I think it's worth pointing again to the specific microcosm of South Florida and the enormous changes that have happened in the local musical scene, say, in the last decade or so. And I told Rich I was going to talk about 95.7 because to me, this is the most dramatic representation of that change. Anybody from South Florida here, Miami? Okay, so do you know 95.7? Used to be this kind of like jazz adult contemporary station. Now it's Guadonimas, which is kind of amazing if you think about this longstanding history of basically banning Cuban music on the airwaves in Miami, that since August 2016, there is 
an official Cubaton station in Miami. And not just the Cubaton station like they play Gente de Zona, like everybody else plays Gente de Zona now, but no, actually a Cubaton station that plays contemporary Cuban music. That almost sounds like a station that you would hear if you were listening to the radio in Cuba, except if you're listening to the radio in Cuba, you're also going to hear Electric Light Orchestra and all the other amazing things that Cuban radio has long played. Um, so I think that this transformation is really encouraging, and it speaks to the fact that even though Cuban audiences, of course, never lost their ears or their taste for North American popular music, that maybe uh, U.S. audiences will again learn to love Cuban music the way that they just did, uh, they, they once did, and not just the Cuban music that maybe meets their expectations of what Cuba is supposed to look and sound like, but Cuban music as it is. Um, and I also think of the fact that, you know, as a result of those migratory law changes that I mentioned, there are many Cuatón artists who actually live in Miami but go back to Cuba to film their music videos and maintain an active fan community on both sides of the Florida Strait. Um, and, and the expansion of that landscape within Miami, what that might mean even for places beyond. So I think the question in tracing Cuba-U.S. connections in the area of popular culture is now what happens to these kinds of transformations and changes of recent years in light of escalating dis diplomatic tensions. Um, so if you haven't been following the news, uh, we're getting more and more whispers that a big announcement is on the way and what that might mean um, for the ability of all of us to continue to enjoy Cuban music on this side of the Florida Straits or even for Cuban groups to be able to tour in the United States is still quite unclear. So it's up to all of us as fans of Cuban music to actually pay attention to the politics of Cuban music as well, because unfortunately, these two things also go hand in hand. With that, I'll leave it there. Oh, here they are, the rest of the band, or part of the band. Here are they, just in time. Fortunately, the pizza's all gone. Hi, Miriam. Um, shout out also to Colin Laverty, now Miriam Sykes, who I mentioned at the outset, and they're actually now here with Cuba Educational Travel, uh, which is uh, managing and organizing Cuba Funk's first U.S. Four. So let me do a quick introduction of both uh, Eric Simafonk and Sebastian, and then I'm going to turn it over to both of them um, for a bit. But let me just say a little bit about them. So Eric Iglesias Rodriguez, also known as Simafonk, um, he's a former Cuban medical student from Pinar del Rio, Cuba, and he's someone who's forged his own unique sound by mixing and mashing up funk and Afro-Cuban beats. Um, his breakout hit, Me Voy, uh, can be heard currently everywhere from bars in Miami to European dance clubs. And he's also earned for the video a slew of Cuban music awards. He was recently named one of Billboard's 10 Latin artists to watch in 2019. And he made his U.S. debut on March 13th at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. Since then, he's been playing for sold-out crowds at prestigious venues like Tipitina's in New Orleans and uh, just a few nights ago at National Sawdust in Brooklyn, New York. And he'll be here in the U.S. Uh, through the end of the month before he heads home, and then we'll be traveling to Europe uh, in July to continue promoting his independently produced, which is actually quite interesting, uh, first album, Terapia. And again, for those who came in late, a reminder, you can catch the full show tonight at Ocean Mist in Matunic at 9 p.m. Is that uh, uh, Tempo Habanero or, or Tempo Piñareño a la nueve? The music will start at 10. Okay, good to know. It, but it is 21 over, I understand. Uh, 21 plus, is that correct? Okay, we're going to look into, the, into that. All right, so uh, Sebastian Otero is uh, a graduating senior here at Brown University uh, from Puerto Rico. He just handed in his thesis, his senior honors thesis on Monday. 
directed by uh, colleague Joshua Tucker of uh, the music department. And uh, he's a double concentrator on Eric, Erika, Erika. Where's that? There's Erika Durande. Indeed, because he's a double concentrator in ethnomusicology and also in Latin American and Caribbean studies here at Brown. Um, he spent, and he'll tell you about it, at least a semester in Havana. Um, and that's where he met Eric. Uh, I believe part of his thesis has just been uploaded to Spotify, um, which is his new album. Already has 15,000 uh, plus listens for his, uh, his tune, Miali Mantequilla. Not bad. So, so that's uh, Eric and, and Sebastian. I want to invite both of you, starting with Eric perhaps, just to tell us a little bit um, about your music. I mean, how, do you, how do you describe and understand your own musical creativity and output? And we'll start with Eric. Welcome, Eric. Hey, 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 hey. Sí. Bueno, Gaero, gracias. Thank you very much for, for receiving here. It's a big pleasure. It's a, it's a big gift that finally I could visit Sebastian here in his place, well, in his school, and, and, and congratulations. It's amazing, uh, and thank you for, for the invite. Uh, we, are, we are traveling uh, this tour, uh, promoting the first album that called Therapy, Therapia, and it was an independent production. It was a, basically, it was experimental. I was experimenting, as making experimentation with the sounds. I was starting to, to work by my own with Ableton, Ableton Live is the program that I use. And before that, I was playing with other bands, with other, uh, example, with Interactivo, with Oyo Colorado. Uh, I was making chorus with many artists in Cuba, but I was trying to get uh, my own song and trying to start to do my own thing. So I started to, to write the song. But I don't know music. I don't know the chorus. I don't know, I don't know the the meaning of the theory of music. So I started to, to try to find a, a program, a software who could help me to, to build my own arrangement without music knowledge. So I found Ableton Life and I started to record something with the voice after I started to, to call some friends that came and translate that in, in, in the instrument. And at the end, we was building the songs one by one. And we finally, I get therapy. And was approximately eight months, maybe, or nine months, maybe more. And when I when I just finished the the album, I I try to to find a way to mix them and and try to find a way to put in the Cuban uh, artistic medium for the for the people, proceed the acceptation of the people. So until now, the people have been receiving the music like super cool. Everybody was I guess super surprised and, and that the the this kind of music that I'm, that we are making now uh, was again in Cuba because, like you say, like, uh, congratulations, thank you for the for the presentation. I'm agree 100 percent with you. We have many references from Iraquere to uh, Frijol Negro is a band that I hear a lot. Uh, it's like they got the funk. For me, they got the funk movement in, in Cuba. Is the, the funk that that I follow from Cuba. And and at the end, many people was. Uh, looking for that kind of music again in the Cuban environment because this kind of music disappeared in one moment. So nobody do that n uh, no more in Cuba. So uh, now when we arrived to the musical scene, to the musical scene in Cuba, they was like, a, "Oh, that's great. We got it. We got it again this this thing. We have a, a, a hungry crowd of people looking for that." So as, as soon that we arrived to the musical scene, we start to fool the places and the people will start to receive the music like super fine. Mm, basically, uh, what we are doing now, that now we are producing all together, in the, now we do more like grouple stuff uh, because it's better and it's more uh, healthy and it's more organic. Uh, now we are just yeah, playing, playing with the music. We... We, we start to, I don't know, the last song that we built is, it was uh, Diego Bejugo and the guitar player. He, he bring to the sound check a, a riff, a funk riff. So Raul is the musical director. He started to follow and everybody started to put together. I made the lyrics in the sound check and we played the song one hour left, left after in, in a concert. And the song has been like super great. The people love the song. We call La Papa. You will hear if you go to the 
to the concert. And basically it's that. We are having fun. We are having a lot of fun now. It's no, it's no, we ain't got no mystical stuff or no theoretical things. It's just we're having a lot of fun and trying to share what we are doing with every, all the people possible. That's the, that's the thing. Um, in my case, um, I started playing violin when I was four. So that's the primary instrument. I've always been in love with hip hop. Um, since I was a little kid, my, my parents would expose me to CDs of Teo Calderon, Boricas, Pico C, when I was like six years old. And so that love stayed with me. And around when I was 16, I started to write music, um, write lyrics, and kind of play with around with the guitar. I didn't know much then. And when I came here, um, I didn't know what to study. And I, I came undecided, and I took an ethnomusicology course. And it totally blew my mind to, to have that other approach to music in a more humanistic sense. And so from there, I started, I think, to see music a little bit different. And by playing here in the U.S. for the past four years, I was able to really get immersed into a lot of um, American genres like neo soul, um, soul itself, um, hip hop, punk, and I try to mix that then with music genres from the Caribbean, um, specifically more from Puerto Rico, in a way to. I don't know, I, I think to create new sounds based on my movement and geographic movement, I went to Cuba in the fall of 2016. And there, for example, I met this Cuban singer-songwriter and rapper called Camancola that sang and rapped at the same time. And for me, that, that was a very interesting discovery um, to know that I could do both as well. So I think I pretty much, in terms of content of my music, I try to make music that is going to bring people together, um, is going to build some sense of community, it's going to stay critical to whatever is going on in the island. Um, and I, for me, particularly for me, I think stories and telling stories is one great way of doing that just because it takes from an individual experience that might not be mine, but is shared among the collective. And I think that's, like, for me, um, taking references from uh, Ruben Blades, for example, um, the same Ana Tiyu does some, his, some stories in her songs. I feel it's a very powerful way to communicate those messages. Um, I formed a band called Sebastiano Terilaponina, um, which is a Cuban phrase, actually. That kind of means to do a potluck, like people put, like, for example, two bucks each to buy a pizza, um, so they make a ponina to put something. And that, that was pretty much the, the, the statement of, of the group, just because of its diversity um, in terms of the members. Um, there's seven Puerto Ricans, um, some are from the mountains and the rural parts, um, other from the metropolitan area. Um, there's this um, percussion player who is like the whitest, blondest, bluest eyes looking guy um, that I met in Cuba studying abroad. And he plays the percussion and he's amazing when you see him dance. Um, rumba is unbelievable. And then um, the keyboard player is from Atlanta. Um, he grew up in, in a gospel church. So that's his music like that's his side of the music and that's pretty much it's it's a very collaborative effort i propose the ideas um and i have a vision of what i want the sound to uh, the band to sound like but it's very open to to other um, suggestions and i feel having just such an amazing creative group can be either counterproductive or really productive um, counterproductive in the sense that too many ideas and we don't decide which one is the best um, and then productive because we get a lot of really good ideas um, and I want to talk a little bit about the current music scene in Puerto Rico and in terms of its um, political and economic context um, so as you might all know maybe um, in 2016 there was this PROMESA Act um, signed by Congress and Barack Obama that imposed an oversight control board to PR 
to oversee that structuring. That means a lot of austerity measures that we don't have a say into what is going to be cut and what not. So it's pretty much going back 100 years of anti-democratic um, systems. And in this context, plus Huracan Maria, um, the island is pretty much still devastated. Um, a lot of people don't have jobs. It's, it's very critical. Um, and interestingly enough, even when there was power out, you could listen to musicians in the streets playing together, playing in squares, neighbors getting together and gathering. So it's really fascinating to see how active and productive the music scene right now in PR is in comparison to the current political and economic context. Um, I think it has become a powerful way of resilience and resistance um, coming from the young generation. You have artists, and I'm going to just do a list, um, but you can find them all in digital platforms. Emina, which is a quartet of four women um, that mix um, Puerto Rican folk genres and Afro-Puerto Rican folk genres with electronic elements and hip-hop. You have Andrea Cruz, which is doing a contemporary version of Puerto Rican folk. You have Mise Gallo, a big band um, that does a lot of rap fusion. You have Senor Langosta doing um, experimental jazz, punk, and pretty much with a very apocalyptic um, vision. You have Baba Gris, another experimental fusion group. You have Piquete, which is a neo-soul plena, which is an Afro-Puerto Rican genre. Um, uh, you have... Um, and I'm also, I think, I'm a little bit part of that scene as well. I'm just trying to help in whatever way and just bring community and try to make it happen if those that are up are not going to do it for us. Please uh, come to the microphone so people are watching via live streaming or watch the recording afterwards can actually hear what you, you've asked. Um, and if no one comes up to the microphones quickly, we can ask one of the panelists, either Pablo or Jenny, if they have a question for Eric and Sebastian. Why don't we start with that? And then those of you who have questions, come on up as you're, as you're ready. Pablo, did you have a question so, for? Uh, so, so, okay, my question, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yeah, so my question to Eric, I have two questions. One was the reference, you can sort of lay them out more. And then how do you feel um, being this one artist now, this or Yeah, I have. <clears throat> yeah, and um, well, the, the reference from, from Cuba, that reference that you put it, that, that is what I, what I hear many, many time ago from Cuba. And also Benny More, Bola de Nieve, of yes. course, all, all, all these guys of, that they made show that was more that play that they would get to the stage and they, they make a show. And I'm from the U.S., uh, Foncaelli, Ohio player, uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, Marvin Gaye, James Brown, uh, Uncle Sam, uh, um, um, well, a lot of a lot of people from here, from USD or from the other school, George Clinton, Maceo Barker, P. Wiley, Fred Wesley, uh, and oh, many more. And for the for the how I feel about the about this about this movement, this moment that we are living now. Uh, now we're living in a crazy time because we came out of Cuba before many things happened. So uh, we are making like a huge tour for U.S. We are getting a lot of acceptation from many people, and and at the same time we are getting in touch with a lot of musicians that they was living in Cuba and they are not living already in Cuba or musicians that they live in Cuba. And they are traveling also, and they, <clears throat> sorry, we start to just to to build like a, a lot of things. It's, it's more that, that, that words is like a feeling that now it's possible that you 
and the Cuban musician came came to US and can organize a tour. Mm. So is that is that is what I'm doing now. If that is possible, a lot of people in Cuba feel this window getting open, and a lot of musicians in US feel this window getting open to get musicians to play here with them. You know, mm. because this is what happened with a lot of you know, no Pedro Martinez, all these musicians they have. They all study together with greatest musicians that they are living in Cuba already. So it's this possibility to start to to travel and tour everybody for for US is amazing. And yeah, we we are like moving the moving together for the for the Cuban music in the world. That's what we're doing now. My my generation and my my music style, we are doing that all together. It's amazing. More, so one more question is why why please. Uh, I I like I like a lot I like a lot yeah I I I really love uh, the James Brown style and I I see that you you so sometimes you see something and you get like a, in the ties I, that happened to me I saw this the rhythms uh, is is amazing for me and I mix with the Afro Cuban that is almost really it's really similar to the Cuban music to the Cuba Afro Cuban music this both came from from the drum from the groove this came from Africa so it's really really similar. And in this connection with Africa, this is sort of Africanism through music. Um, we we've talked about the American side. What about? No, definitely no, no, no. This is this is one of my bigger references, Fela Gudi. Yeah, for me, it's like James Brown, Benny Moore, and Fela Gudi. They mm. these three guys, they they knew what they was doing. They put new stuff in there. Let me uh, invite uh, a local uh, musician and artist, uh, Taino Boricua, uh, Joel Rosario Tapia. He's a painter. If you're interested, there's an exhibit in the building on the other side of uh, the courtyard. And uh, several of Joel's and also some other people's uh, paintings are currently there if you want to go and take a look afterwards. Joel? I don't know. Looks. Hang on, hang on. We're getting it. What does um, that play in your music? No, uh, no I, I don't understand a couple of words that you say the, the, and the pan African. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, we, well, um, definitely, that's what we do, and that's what we do. Who we do hundred percent. I what what I what I feel with with the art that I make. I I I don't folk my my music my my art in in terms of a political or racial state. What I'm doing is a message of talk about positive stuff. I'm trying to to that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing, and I'm and I and I feel it like like this. I'm trying to get in the stage and I'm trying to the crowds who came to the stage for one hour and a half or two hours of concert. They feel fine and they forget the troubles. That's what I'm doing. But even when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm sure because the things happen and the people see, we try to spread a, a message in the groove, in the visuality, that the people feel that. You know, the people feel that in the all time, many of the black uh, people who, who, who was trying to get in, in improved, who was trying to improve in the in the economic or, or, or arts system in the US example, was a couple of them that have a, an ideology of be successful. 
try to try to be conform with yourself, try to be proud of yourself. You don't have to say when you are this the people feel it. You know, the people feel it because nobody tell me nobody tell me that that I have I have to to feel to to be proud of the black and I have to fight against stuff that happened with, with us, you know, in the in the world. Nobody tell me that, you know, I start to feel it because I start to to hear James Brown example that is an example of of be successful or be fighting and be clear of, of you you put your art and this go far away from many things that you do. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the people in a state that they feel fine in the st- with me, with the with the band, with our with our message that is happiness. People have a lot of troubles and and, and I don't like it. In my music, I like, put the troubles in the face of the people because they already know they trouble. They are dealing with the trouble in every minute of the day. They are dealing. If they don't have a house, they in you. They go to your concert and you're gonna say to them, "You don't have a house." Again and again and again. That's that's mm. something that I I don't I don't like. What I'm doing is which is talking about happiness. I'm trying to the people feel fine. Think that the happiness is an addictive system. You try to, to put happiness in the people when they don't feel happy. They try to. To put away all the stuff or feel that again, so that's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, in in my case, I I think I right now I have incorporated elements of the places where I have lived part of my life. So I feel in that sense, a representation of my movable identity where I've been. Um, and for me, that's also part of the group itself. Um, just because of how diverse the my my group is, um, even though we're all male, which is something that should be said, um, I just give the space to add whatever they feel they are from to just put it in the music, and and make it and make it one. So it's type of like a a, a solid potluck of our own experience, and I'm definitely excited to collab with Sima Funk, for example. Um, I think the Cuba and Puerto Rico dialogues has been so long in history. I mean, you have the efforts of rebellions against the Spanish regime since then, been back and forth. And I also feel um, that Dominican Republic should be added into that equation. I'm thinking of the language, right, that unifies us. But definitely, um, I would be so excited to either bring Sima Funk to PR um, bring Daimato Sena or go to Havana and definitely just build from from those relationships that started before making music. Yeah. Terrific. Are there, are there other questions? I don't see anyone else uh, coming up to the microphone. Here's your last chance. One more? Okay. And that we're probably only going to have time for this one because we are running a little bit late. Please, and please say who you are. Thank you. Is there a question there or just a, a comment? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll answer the question. Yes. Um, any other, any questions from students or you guys are strangely quiet? Is it the end of the year exam, research paper, stuff weighing down on you? Jenny, please, absolutely. Therapia, since you started a doctor, um, the relationship yeah, between and use yeah. the and also about forming a former medical music super group and medic no. not in medical de la salsa no, 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 de la salsa. medico <laughs> yeah, no I, 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 I didn't I didn't gra- graduate I, I led the school for move to the to the capital to start to make the music but I have a hundred percent relationship with with the music my family many members of my family they were in the health care, so my mom is psychology, my uncle is surgeon. So I all the time in the house I super identify with that. So I'm, I left the medicine and and I led the the family tradition but I, I make therapy in other ways. For that reason I made music for, for people. And then that that's the the, the relation is also is medicine. Medicine, definitely. Okay. <laughs> 
So uh, I think that's it for Q&A. Um, why don't I invite the musicians, so Eric, and I know uh, Sebastian, and I believe a couple of Eric's band members may participate in this, and, and let's hear uh, a song or two, Hello, okay? Man. And then come hear the electric thing tonight. Diego, ¿dónde está? Mm. Mm. No, 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 Ah. Veremos. ¿En cuál? Sí, ese va lo va a hacer, ese va lo va a hacer. Carlos, ¿quieres hacerlo ahora? Yo sí, primero. Vamos con me voy y nos vamos en Congo primero. O no, o vamos, vamos a hacer el mío primero y después le hacemos el tuyo y le metemos otro coro y nos dale, dale, dale. Bueno, a ver, esta canción se llama Me Voy. Es la primera canción del disco. Afro Cuban Cosa. Lo que tú quieras. Ah, coño. Quiere que chiste de Tú quieres cheque, ¿no? Hey, man. ¿Cuánta cheque? Vamos.